Hey guys, and welcome back to Rage Gaming and more Dragon's Dogma 2. Today we're talking about that true end game, the true ending of the game, and the end game that is the unmoored world we can now explore. All that ocean water is dried up, and that's revealed new locations on the seafloor to explore. Here we can find new enemies with unique item drops, unique items in newly revealed chests, and new mechanics to actually contend with. Like, for example, here's this powered up unmoored white, which is actually a lich, strong enough to revive a cyclops and have it help fight. There's still lots of familiar enemies that are going to be around that drop new loot and if you're unaware i've made a full guide to the best order that i've tested for this world the result will have you basically have the seafloor shrine full of people as a hub with access to things like all the blacksmiths all the vendors in one spot in the comments of that guide though we had one consistent question what are the most important things to know to do in this limited section of the game how does it really work and what's the raw info that's exactly what this video is going to be all the advice that you're hopefully looking for so let's get started to begin with, there's kind of one main thing you need to know about being in this world, and that's the time limit, which is being heavily discussed at the moment. There actually isn't any time passing when you're in this world. Normally when you're looking at the menu, you've got this dial that's moving around, but it's really just not doing anything. It serves no meaning anymore. Time is no longer passing, so we're here, quote unquote, infinitely. Obviously, we are restricted though. You're on a time limit in the form of rest. So when you go to a bed and sleep, that gives up one of your 12 total rests while you're here. But obviously there's the other side of it, this huge fog cloud that's moving in and consuming the world. My cloud has completely stopped and it will no longer progress, but I still only have 12 rests total. And what happens when I use up my 12 rests is nothing too exciting. And all the enemies and monsters that I would respawn when I rest, they no longer respawn. So at a certain point, this world is going to become completely empty of anything really relevant to do. So even if you overcome the restriction of the cloud moving in, you still have a quote unquote time limit of 12 rests. And at a certain point, there's going to be no reason to stay here. Behind me is this main red beacon. It's the last one that appears in the C4 shrine. And if I was to go interact with this, I'd do the final events of the game and go into New Game Plus. So like I said, I have a full guide to all the details and the best order to do things, so here's a very vague overview. You enter the unmoored world by using the Godsbane Blade on yourself during the Dragonflight section at the end of the game. Now you're in this world, I think the order to do things would be to first activate the C4 Shrine as a functional hub, then go get your main pawn back, and then proceed to all of the red beacons around the world, defeating the challenges they present. And while you're doing that near whatever relevant town, you convince the people to evacuate their town and get everyone in the hub of the C4 Shrine. Lastly, go to the body of the Talos Giant, have your pawn use it to defeat one of the major enemies, or multiple if you did it even earlier. And the result of all of this, we like I said, this hub full of NPCs, so that whatever you want to do, whatever you want to upgrade, it's all in one place. Obviously, when we get here, we have an upgraded version of the Dragon Forge, which means we can enhance our gear to max level, but it also means he's got that updated stock of the best items, or rather specifically weapons of the game, and some of the best armor that's available as well. In this world, though, there is some unique things that are worth looking for. For example, what about all this unique gear? The Dominator's armor, we've got a crown here, some Sabatons, a Predator's more. Basically, we're looking at different sets that are completely unique to this world that you can't get anywhere else. They're found in chests or even from specific enemies you need to kill. Some of these items are familiar items and drop from familiar enemies with a little bit more health, but there are unique items that you can't get anywhere else, and I'll list those out for you in this video. In any case, you do what I've just listed to get the hub in this order. If you followed my guide, you'll have rested once, maybe twice, and that'll leave you with at least 10 rests to fully explore this world and get everything you need done. Honestly, you'll probably probably only need like two or three, and you don't necessarily need to continuously rest to maintain your time here. One obvious example of that will be the All Heal Elixir. When you consume it, you get all your health and stamina back without having to rest and give up one of your limited rests. If your pawns are hurt and you need to actually get them back functional again, well, don't worry about that. Just come to the nearest pawn stone and enter the rift, and you're just going to get rid of your two temporary pawns to get two new ones in that are fully healed and ready to go. Again, saving on potential rests, you might be wasting. Another funny trick that you can do if you're lacking on heals and you don't want to waste to save is to come to the vocation guild. And if you change vocation for the one that you currently are to another, you get a full heal. And if you change back, well then great, you didn't actually have to spend anything and you got another heal, again, saving another rest. So obviously there are ways to get around having to rest to heal up. You just gotta be aware that rests are your like most recent save. So if you do a load of stuff and then die and you don't have a wake stone on hand to heal with and revive with, you'll go back to the last time you rested. And that could be a while ago if you are using these tips. So just be aware of that. 
Next, let's talk about crystals, because from what I've shown you with the new Dragonforge, obviously you'll need a little bit of them to get the final enhancement, but the main thing is to buy the best weapons in the game, which are 110 of these crystals each, and then you've got the armor, which is 20 for the head, 70 for the actual chest, and another 30 for the legs. Just for one vocation, one set, that's 120 of these crystals alone. And maybe you play multiple vocations, maybe you want to get a load of these unlocked. Well, just as normal, you're going to be hunting drakes to get crystals. Maybe Maybe you followed my recent guide about this and have a nice pile as you entered this place. But there are going to be drakes and even more crystals available in this world. While you're doing the main story, you're going to get a load of them. More than enough to buy at least one weapon and a full set and a little bit extra. If you're going to hunt, say, the lesser dragons around the world and also, say, some of the drakes that are lying around, I would recommend that you run a thief, whether you're playing the thief or have one in the party or even running multiple. They come with this passive core skill called bump and lift and it means light attacks the carve attack has a chance to steal items with a drake that's probably going to be crystal so you can still get quite a lot from just spamming light attacks and intentionally not trying to kill it just giving as many calves as you can or you could run say the pilfer and plunder weapon skill which when you knock an enemy down means you get to steal from it so an extra go for more crystals at very least i do think because of that while you're in the unmod world you should have at least one thief in the party running these things because it just means an extra go of the very valuable loot you'll find while you're in here. One final thing that I want to talk to you about while you're in here is your pawns. Specifically, your main pawn though. At max affinity, your pawn actually influences the ending sequence with slightly new events. I'm not going to spoil anything, and it's also not anything insane. It's a little scene change and a little nod for your efforts. And so if that interests you, it's well worth doing. You know when you're max affinity with your main pawn, because like any NPC you've got max relationship with, they'll kind of blush when you go near them. But I know methods to affect your pawn affinity are these. You can regularly talk with the pawn to slightly give it a small bump. You can high five them whenever they offer. In the normal world, you can take them to a hot spring or even to a barber for another bump. Mainly though, you want to avoid letting them die because they take an affinity loss whenever they do. But yeah, when you have max affinity, you will have that slightly changed final scene if you're interested. Okay, so now the unique endgame equipment we should talk about. Like I said, there's 10 specific ones that you can get that I've found throughout the world, and there's even more that you can get from some certain enemies, which aren't entirely unique pieces of gear. Let's go for the 10 unique ones first that you're not going to be able to find elsewhere. And I'll batch them in the region they're found for ease of use. Okay, as I just said, we're going to start with the Vermund region. I guess this is because it's pretty much the biggest region that most of them are here. The first one we have is actually right next to Vernworth. There's this area here where all the water's dried up. You can come down to the west side where the docks are is the easiest way to get down here. And just north of it is where we're going to be going. So here's the docks behind me, the bridge, the aqueduct. Just ahead of me, we can see something moving around. It's a Gore Chimera. And with that, we should have finished this off. There we go. Easy peasy. There's the Dominator armor, Ring of Aggression, Stoutness Extract. As you can see, it had it on it. With that, we have the Dominator's armor, so let's go to the next location. Next up then, we have the Summoner's Crown, which we can get in pretty much the same area. Again, next to Vernworth, again at the docks at the northwest, you can get down to what was like the river area. This time, we're going to go south and around to get on this path, come to the Southern Ruins, which is kind of one of the main boss fights, and you'll find a beacon here if you haven't actually defeated that yet. There's also some loot just beyond that, so let's head around there and go Go to it. So now we're over in those ruins where that boss fight or beacon takes place and you can see there's this path here that heads southeast. That's where we need to go through this gap in the wall. And yeah, just like that, hidden in this little alcove, right by where you fight the beacon, is a chest and within is the summoner's crown. Absolutely something you can miss when you come over here, but there's another item. Okay, so next we've got the Conqueror Sabatons northwest along this main road. We have this kind of lake or pond that used to exist here. So naturally now the water's gone, that's gone. So if we approach that pond or whatever, you can see we can go down into it. And what will be revealed down here is this little tomb entrance, like a structure that used to exist here a long time ago. Just passing down the kind of main stairs that lead you down and down, you will eventually meet some skeletons that attack you. But more importantly, there's going to be this chest, which has the sabatons within it. So not too bad to get, but obviously there is a very strong enemy down here. If you want to defeat it, fell lord parts are well worth getting. So if you've got something related to upgrading, I think it's worth staying and killing it. But just so you can get 
get a look at them. Here are the Conqueror's Sabatons and their base stats. Right, our next item then is Predator's Maw, which is found just northwest of where we just were, just below, say, the Elf Village of Sacred Arbor. Down where this river used to run, you can come down to this kind of mountain ruins area and go down there. So right where this used to be water, there's a chest there, for example. Let's just clear out the enemies. And inside this chest, we have our nice item of Predator's Maw. So nothing too intense to fight. You just actually have to come here. And like I say, it's right by my marker on the east side of that wall where those ruins would, say, turn into a waterfall and go down a river. Here are the stats of Predator's Maw. Okay, so our next item is the Agamenium Gallia, which, as you can see, is just east of the Checkpoint Rest Town. It's kind of a river that runs under the bridge of the town. And if we follow that to the east here, we have this clear lack of water. And at the tip of it is where you're going to find the chest with the actual helm inside. In any case, once I'm here, you can very clearly see that there's kind of a cave entrance here, and that has the chest. And inside the chest is the helm. And here's a look at it if you want to see the starting stats. Okay, so our next item is actually just to the south, almost as if we're going to go to Bak Patel. This whole lake that previously was filled with water is obviously empty, and now down here, roughly near this marker anyway, there's going to be an enemy and a chest. The best way to get there, I found, is to come through the cavern that would previously take us south, but towards the end of it, you actually come out to this kind of balcony and make your way down. So just enter the cave and just kind of go straight through, ignore the enemies, get to the other end. And as you pass through the cave, you'll come to this kind of balcony area where we can see what I'm talking about, where all that used to be water now we can just kind of work our way down to where we need to go as you can see when we get to the bottom we start kind of facing south and there's a drake waiting for us you can just run up and loot the chest that's hiding behind it to get the greaves but they're well worth killing so i'm gonna do that and with that we got the drake and now we should have some interesting loot we've got two dragon scales a wake stone fairy stone uh, so you basically got enhanced loot like all the enemies of this world compared to the normal ones but like i said the thing we're actually here for is the chest which has the greaves inside and here's a little look at the stats of the greaves if you are interested. So for our last item that we're actually going to get in the Vermund region, you can see them actually over by the Nameless Village now. On the east side, it's pretty much the only item over here. And that makes sense because, yeah, at the start, Melv is pretty much consumed. Down in the kind of surrounding moat or river that just goes around the town. There's a little road here that leads to the back, which seems to be a nice little entrance that we can get down to. And you can see there's just a chest waiting down at the bottom for me. And in this chest, we have the Hood of Darkness, our first piece that I can actually wear from this set. Here are the stats completely unupgraded, which is pretty Pretty impressive to say it's not that far behind a fully upgraded endgame item. Okay, so next up we have the Promethean Hood, which is actually finally in a different region. It's in the Batali Desert. And on the west side, you have this long river that's running down. And in the center here, just below this kind of wood forest section, there is going to be this item that's going to be the Hood. There are a few ways to get down there. I like this western route that leads onto the river. And then you can just casually walk in without having to drop from any high point. And as we make our way down, we're going to encounter, there it is, the Fell Lord standing right Right by the chest with the item in it and i can just sneak in and grab the chest and there it is the hood and there's the item you don't actually have to fight the fell lord here are the stats of the hood though if you are interested okay for the final two items we have the assassin's breaches and we have the monarch's crown and i've got two markers here to show you where they are they are right next to our new port crystal agamon volcanic island that actually begins to exist once we reach the unmod world right next to where we actually spawn when we teleport to this is the item it's in a chest just below us down below these rocks so we just make our way down and somewhere around here should be a chest there it is just under the kind of main pillar section just like that there's the monarch crown very easy to pick up compared to some of these so for the last item then we have the assassin's breaches pretty much near this mark. It's that main bridge that was destroyed by the Talos as it was passing through this area, but now with all the water gone, we can see down below. Just ahead of us is this kind of rocky landscape, and the chest and the loot is just over there. It's tucked away in a pretty hidden place. As you come here, just look towards the kind of northern side, this wall, and walk along it. And eventually you'll see that this little gap where the chest is hidden and tucked away. And inside we have our last item, the Assassin's Breaches. There are the stats if you are interested, but those are the 10 kind of unique items that I've been able to find hidden in these new locations where the water has been removed. It's weird, the items feel kind of random, like not full sets, but still it is interesting to find something worth exploring these new regions. 
So that's the 10 unique gear items. But like I said, generally you can kill deadly enemies of this world. Take this lesser dragon that's just outside of Back Batal. It's got a little bit more health than your normal lesser dragon. And that's kind of the tip to let you know this has got something special. In this case, it drops the Arch Conjurer's robe when I killed it. And there's going to be a lot of examples of this. But at least for the 10 unique pieces of gear in the unmoored world, I've shown you how to get those. But for now, that's absolutely everything I can discuss and share what I've explored and researched my best knowledge. I hope this has helped you find what you want or give you some security in your exploration, you know, when is best to do it and how it all works. If you guys do have any extra information or tips, then do drop it in the comments. But for now, I've been Hollow, you've been you. Thanks for watching. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos, dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes, bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice to reiterate that it is nice to look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage is, uh, goodbye.